Hello, I'm Caleb Howard, and this is Tales from Sacred Texts. The world is built on stories. From the beginning of time, humans have immersed themselves in legends and myth. When God himself wanted to explain to us what he was like, he didn't push elaborate treatises, but instead told stories about humanity. In this podcast, I tackle the concept of religion through stories and legends. Told through a 21st century lens, I explain to religious and non-religious people alike the stories that lie at the very heart of the belief that maybe there is a God, and maybe he really is good. Welcome, and I first want to nerd out about how this is Tales from Sacred Texts' 50th episode. The big 5-0, and I never in a million years thought I'd get this far. Jephthah, my 25th episode, feels a million miles away. The very rough Tobit, what's his family name, seems even further. I'm so thankful to God for giving me the strength to grow as a person and the ability to tell 50 of his stories to the world. I want to say it one more time. Let's get started with Tales from Sacred Texts, episode 50. Mike Tyson versus Buster Douglas, the biggest boxing upset in history. Mike Tyson was favored to win by as much as 42 to 1. I mean, seriously, he was fighting a dude named Buster. The Killers wrote a song about the upset, but it's not a sports song. It's a song about seeing your hero come crumbling down and the sinking in your stomach and rage in your chest when you realize the person you staked your entire soul upon was no god, but just a human. The denial you go through as you accuse your own eyes of telling you a lie. The denial, rage, anger, and pain that comes from seeing your hero fall is something you'll only understand if you've gone through it. Maybe it was Trump's loss in 2020 and subsequent fall from grace, or maybe it was a significant other who you wrapped your entire life and identity in, and now that person is telling you that you aren't the one they love anymore. In either case, your hero is dead, and a part of you died with them. I remember clearly the very first time I heard the story I'm about to tell. I was in my grandmother's turquoise van, my uncle driving us back home after a late night at church. As we drove through the streets of Columbus, Ohio, the radio began to play a song about Uriah, and my uncle commented on King David's actions. David did not do that. I protested. The shepherd boy, giant slayer, badass warrior, brave king, could not have fallen so low. It was my uncle's mistake. I thought someone had lied about a character in a book and I felt let down and betrayed. I'd seen two badly drawn pictures of some white guy with funny facial hair who looked nothing like King David. Imagine how crushed his people were. Heroes fall, and when they do, they fall hard. The earth shakes and so do we, as we are confronted with the fact that our worldview must change. The killers talk about how you can hide from the world and build sand castles in your mind, but... Quote, you'll never grow up, baby, if you don't look. And we're about to look. We've built David up with three poignant episodes, and now we're about to bring him crashing down. Maybe we'll learn something from the fallout. We'll tell the story of David's fall in the next two episodes. You won't have necessarily had to have heard the other David episodes to listen to this story, but I strongly recommend listening to them first, especially if you're less familiar with the story of David because I'll be assuming you're familiar with a lot of David's backstory in this episode. For those who need the general backstory, I'll summarize my first three David episodes. David is one of the most famous characters in both the Protestant and Catholic Bibles. He started out as a shepherd boy, but gained importance in the king's court after he killed a monstrous giant who was threatening the people. As time went on, David got too important in the king's court, and the king turned on him. King Saul threw all of his resources into killing David, fearing that David would take the throne from him. There was a prophecy involved somewhere in all of this. It became a self-fulfilling prophecy when Saul paid absolutely no attention to the maintenance of his kingdom until an enemy horde was on his doorstep. He and much of the royal family fell in battle, leaving a power-hungry general, a spoiled and weak heir, and the people of Israel to pick up the pieces. After a war and a lot of populist support, David rose to power. 
We ended the previous David episodes as David finally consolidated his kingdom. We pick up the story approximately 10 years later. A major content warning this time. Heavy sexual themes and repeated non-graphic mentions of sexual assault. Heavy violence, including murder. The men shuffled into town, the right side of their beards missing, nude from the waist down, and their genitals hanging exposed. Their heads hung down in the futile hope that no one would recognize them, but people pointed and gasped. Others laughed. The town elders strode up, arms folded in their faces the very expression of severity. What was the meaning of this? David heard of the incident a few days later, and he was incensed. He had heard that an old friend, King Nahash of Ammon, had died, and he sent some men to go pay their respects. And this is how Nahash's son sent them back? Disgraced? David paced the room in anger. The king's advisors told David that this was probably for the best. They'd always thought David's friendship with Nahash was a weird one, seeing as many of the Hebrews still remembered the time that King Nahash had planned to gouge out their right eyes and had only been stopped from doing this when King Saul had intervened at the very last second and defeated Nahash in battle. The advisors knew that King Nahash and David had bonded over Saul as a common enemy, but David wasn't running for his life anymore. The enemy of my enemy is my friend went far, but not that far. At least Nahash's son had left the emissaries with both eyes. In a rare scenario where a story actually starts with the king listening to his advisors, David agreed. The whole Nahash friendship had been a bad look, the kingdom of Ammon was going to pay, and it was time to go to war. Joab was thrilled at the opportunity to fight. It was time to teach these people a lesson they'd never forget. The kingdom of Ammon had hired a few mercenaries, and they thought that was enough to stop the forces of the legendary David? Joab would show them who was boss. David picked up his weapons from the old days, and together, David and Joab led the entire Hebrew army against the Ammonite coalition. And they completely dominated them. They killed so many of the enemy that the Syrian mercenaries flat out refused to ever fight on behalf of the kingdom of Ammon anymore. But alas, the victory wasn't what David and Joab hoped for, because bad winter weather forced them to halt their invasion. Nahash's son, who had started all of this, lay comfortable and cozy in a walled fortress while thousands of innocent men on both sides lay bleeding and dying. Nahash's son had to pay. The two men growled as the rain became more intense. They couldn't continue fighting in this weather. But next spring, they'd finish this. But as the winter rains gradually stopped and the seasons changed, David seemed to have changed as well. He was apathetic, listless, and sluggish. Perhaps it was the weather, or maybe power had finally gotten to him at last. Joab was adamant. This wasn't culturally acceptable. Strong kings went out to war, and only weak ones stayed at home. King David could not stay at the palace in luxury. Relative luxury, it was the ancient world. Well, he sent his countrymen out to suffer extremes of hot and cold, fighting his battles. But the king's word was law, and when Joab finally mustered his troops, He led and left David behind, saying a few choice words to David as he left Jerusalem. The thrill of staying behind wore off quickly. It was like watching TV all day. It sounds really exciting when you start, but just wait until you get to about hour six or seven. And David was on week six or seven. He rolled his eyes. There was nothing fun to do in Jerusalem. He'd climb up and stand on his roof an ancient world high-rise that enabled him to look out over the city. That was about the coolest thing that there was to do. Standing on the roof dropped way down the list of things to do when David, looking at the neighboring houses, saw a woman naked taking a bath. The woman was beautiful. His mouth hung open as he continued to watch her bathe. There were fun things to do in Jerusalem. Well, there was one fun woman to do. His servants nearly choked when he told them what he wanted. First, he had a bunch of wives and sex slaves already, which, ew, that sounded even worse out loud. They were feeling very uncomfortable now. 
Second, could he repeat what had happened? Listen, they were men too. They hadn't been castrated like most of the ancient world kings did to their servants. Thanks for that, by the way. It was really the small things in ancient times. As a thank you, they wanted to talk to him, guy to guy. They wanted to get this story straight. He was telling them that he saw someone from the top of a high rise and immediately knew that he wanted to have sex with her. Was it even possible to get a good look at her from such a distance? Stop rambling. David's voice was a stentorian boom that they seldom heard. Go get her. The little rat-like servant raised his hand. Um, please? David could do what he wanted, but did he know that this woman was Bathsheba? Yes, who cared? Who was Bathsheba? He didn't need to know her name. No, he didn't, the servant acknowledged. But Bathsheba's husband was Uriah. David nodded impatiently. He knew Uriah. One of his best generals, and he didn't want to be on Uriah's bad side. But Uriah didn't have to know. David's eyes glinted with the drunkenness of one who has feasted too long on power. He was king. His word was law. Everything was his. Every woman he desired was his. Who dared deny him anything? He had saved the kingdom. She was his by right. Now go get her. An hour later, it was over. She'd consented, but only in name. She repeatedly refused the out-of-shape, balding, middle-aged David until he warned her that bad things could happen on the field of battle. He worried for her strong young husband's safety. Uriah could take care of himself, sure, but sometimes bad things happen during war. It happened to people who didn't know their place. Bathsheba had folded pretty quickly after that. It was a month before David even really looked back on the event. He walked around like he owned the place, stood on his roof, had a bunch of sex with his sex slaves, ew, ate way too much, and insulted his servants. He was king. They weren't. The only reason he gave his actions a second thought was because Bathsheba sent someone to him covertly to tell him that she'd missed her period. By like two weeks. She was worried. Ew. TMI. Why did that concern him? Like, listen, they'd had a one-time thing and he didn't really care anymore. It had been fun, but this was over. David motioned to send the messenger away, but the messenger held up a hand. Okay, fine, because David apparently needed to have it spelled out, Bathsheba was pregnant with David's child. If the word got out, well, the people wouldn't respect David anymore. He would no longer be the national favorite. He'd already burned through some of the goodwill by not going out to battle, but this would crush his approval rating. David thought a lot after that. But when it came down to it, the solution was quite simple. He'd bring Uriah home from the front, ask him a bunch of questions about the enemy, offer some strategic input and give Uriah some vague message for Joab, and make sure the whole thing took a couple days. Uriah would go home, have sex with his wife, and no one would know the difference. Uriah would think it was his kid, everyone who knew Bathsheba would think it was Uriah's kid. Disaster averted. He sighed in relief. Everything would be all right. We'll find out just how not all right David's plan would go, but that will be right after this. David stomped through the palace angrily. His servants had just told him that Uriah was sleeping on a mat in the servants' quarters. A mat in the servants' quarters, David muttered to himself. A mat. The next morning, he called Uriah back into the throne room. He quizzed the man. Why had he spent the night in the servants' quarters last night? He was free to go home and take it easy. He'd fought hard on the battlefield. Uriah protested vigorously. He was proud of his men, and he was loyal to his commander, Joab. He wasn't going to go home, take it easy, and relax, knowing that his men were waking up alone freezing by their campfires, sweating throughout the day, and eating army rations. How could he dare go home, bathe, eat delicious food, and love his wife? (music) 
God forbid that he take advantage of his position of power and importance to treat himself to privileges the others longed for. He was going to sleep in the servants' quarters until the war was over. Now what did David need from him? David shook his head at Uriah's loyalty and morals, very much not realizing the contrast between Uriah's faithfulness and his selfishness. Instead, he was fixated on how to make Uriah go to his home. He needed Uriah to go, or the game was up for him. He thought through everything in a split second and then pasted on a smile. David needed some more details about the battle and the positioning of the troops. He was going to talk some stuff through with his advisors that evening, and he'd have the message to Joab written by tomorrow morning. As it turned out, David did not. Uriah slept in the servants' quarters again that night. The next morning, David told Uriah that he wanted the general to dine with him and his advisors. He needed some input from someone with their boots on the ground. Uriah, David, and the advisors all ate together, and David whispered to his servants to put extra alcohol in Uriah's drinks. Like, all the extra alcohol. As much as they thought that they could get away with without Uriah noticing. They needed to get Uriah sloshed. Uriah began to slur, sway from side to side, get up and stumble to the bathroom. David shook his head disapprovingly. Getting drunk at the war council? Uriah should just go home to his house and have that wife of his nurse the massive hangover he was certain to have in the morning. Ugh. Uriah stumbled out of the room and David tried to keep a poker face, but inside he was bursting with happiness. But when he stumbled across the sleeping form of Uriah in the servants' quarters an hour later, he had to rush back to his chambers so that he could throw things and punch walls in stress and anger. David stayed up nearly all night, pacing, rushing back and forth, calculating the risk. But he never felt a moment of guilt as he began to write a letter to Joab. Uriah woke the next morning, much earlier than David expected, and ready to travel. He didn't remember much from the previous night. He was really sorry. Guess he had had way more to drink than he thought. But he wanted to get back to the battle. Was David ready for him to leave? David nodded, shoving a scroll in his hand that had been sealed and labeled top secret. These were confidential battle plans, and he needed them taken to Joab, for Joab's eyes only. Could he trust Uriah to deliver them? Uriah smiled. He was so thankful to the king for his trust. He was an immigrant, but still the king gave him such high honors. After the war, maybe he would throw a feast for the king. If David would deign to accept the invitation of one of his ranking generals, that is. David forced a smile. Yes, that would be great. A few days later, Uriah stumbled into the camp, foot-worn and weary. He rushed to Joab's tent, where he handed the letter to Joab. King's orders, Uriah spoke clearly. Joab unfurled the scroll, eyes looking over the paper to scan Uriah as he read the contents. What had happened in Jerusalem? Joab wondered aloud. The king had been so kind to him, Uriah gushed. He was sure that with these new battle plans, the war would be won quickly. Even the hardened Joab looked again at Uriah, his conscience stabbing him as he smiled and dismissed the man. Then he read the scroll again quietly to himself. Put Uriah out in front where the fighting is the fiercest, then retreat from him so that he is left alone to die. Joab's conscience again stabbed at him, but Joab was all too good at resisting its pleadings. He hadn't gotten this high up in the kingdom through morality and restraint. The next morning, when he drew up the battle plans, he sent Uriah to the place where he knew the enemy special forces were stationed. Then, when Uriah and some of the advanced guard had engaged the enemy, Joab told the troops to retreat. Some of them at first refused to turn and run, but Joab screamed at them. Traitors. Treason. Only a few rushed up to help Uriah and his ever-dwindling group of men. The others, tears in their eyes, obeyed the command.
Uriah fought bravely against overwhelming numbers like Boromir against the orcs. Though wounded, Uriah fought on until the enemy finally brought him down. His last thoughts were of Bathsheba. His only regret was that in death, he was leaving her behind. Joab gave the messenger specific instructions on how to convey news of the defeat to David. And it was good for the messenger that he did. Because when David heard the news of how the battle had gone, he screamed curses. What had they been thinking? In mock patience, he explained to them that going too close to the city wall was dangerous because people can throw things. Had Joab heard episode 106 of Tales from Sacred Texts, where a woman had taken down one of the most feared tyrants in Hebrew history because he'd gone too close to a wall and she'd simply dropped a rock on his head? The messenger was glad he'd paid attention to Joab because when he said Uriah was among the dead, the king's reaction completely changed. The king breathed a sigh of relief and smiled. It was war. People died all the time. C'est la vie. He told the messenger not to get all bent out of shape about the Uriah thing. Stuff happens. Wow, that was a little fishy, the messenger thought to himself. He kept a poker face and waited for David to wave and dismiss him. He fled the city as quickly as possible. It was obvious what the king had done. Thoughts burned in the messenger's mind on the way back to camp. The boy hero that he'd grown up hearing legends about. He was just another tyrant. He looked down at the ground. He began to question fighting for king and country. Meanwhile, messengers knocked on Bathsheba's door. When she opened up, the somber looks on their faces told her everything. She fell down, weeping. The love of her life was gone. She could barely hold herself up, and she was definitely not holding it together. She shaved her head in mourning and cried until she could not cry anymore. David had promised that things would work out if she complied. After Bathsheba completed the seven days of ritual mourning, the king sent messengers to her, and she trudged to the palace. Her fight was gone. There were worse things than becoming one of your husband's murderer's many wives. Not too many, but she knew she'd find out what they were if she refused. David grinned as he pledged his undying loyalty to her. They both knew it was a lie, but it was a beautiful lie to David. It was his salvation. He'd gotten away with it, and no one would ever know. David felt nothing but satisfaction. Not one twinge of guilt. He was a god, and all would bow to him. The mastermind, the hero, the king. He knew how to manipulate people to get everything he wanted. This chapter of the Bible ends with the ominous sentence, but the thing David had done displeased Yahweh. That's how we'll end our episode as well, with David still oblivious to the fact that he's done anything wrong. His hubris is unimaginable. We'll wrap up this story next time, showing how David finally realizes the enormity of what he's done and faces a reckoning. Until then, I'll save most of my comments on the story. I will briefly ask you to reflect on David's fall. We've seen three episodes of his heroism, graciousness, and magnanimity. Though interspersed with a few mistakes, David generally stood on the moral high ground, especially when compared to the others of his day. And maybe that's why he fell. David saw himself as superior, and his pride became his downfall. No one is safe. No human hero is safe to look up to. No person should delude themselves that they are beyond the reach of any evil. As God told Cain moments before he murdered his brother, evil is always knocking on the door, desperate to take hold of our lives. It is our duty to constantly, vigorously wage war against it. As Dumbledore says, evil can only be kept at bay. We're only safe as long as we fight.
The reflection that I leave you with is to ask yourself whether you're fighting or whether you're slipping into complacency. Maybe you feel completely incapable of becoming the kind of person David became. But so did David or he never would have allowed himself to fall that far. The road to hell is slippery and we're always two steps closer to evil than we think. Pop culture reference definitely not intended, but I'm leaving it. Only by constant vigilance and the power of God can we resist darkness. Thank you so much for listening to this episode. Come back next time to hear the conclusion of this story and of season three. Thank you so much for joining me in this journey, and I promise that the next episode will be well worth your time. Please tell your friends, leave a five-star review, and share this podcast with the world. I'm so grateful to y'all for listening. Credits to myself, Caleb Howard, for script writing, storytelling, and opening theme music. Credits to Evoke Music for the closing theme. Credits to Evoke Music, Pixabay, YouTube, and Breaking Copyright for the background music. See y'all next time.